Hello, this is the backup video to Ancient History for Monday, October 5th, 2020. Okay, so first off, I've got a question for you. Should a history classroom be comfy, uncontroversial, without difficulty, without emotional pain or tension? Should it be warm and fuzzy? Yes or no, and why? Make sure you have open mind. Yes? Nine, no. Why? Because controversy is at the heart part of history. Do I need to just read your entire syllabus? No, 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 no. Okay, it's good that you've yeah. been listening, though. Yeah, no. That's, the sugar coating kind of just destroys, like, important facts and doesn't let you understand what side you want on the whole thing. Indeed. Sir? Often by making it seem a lot less worse than it is, you only see something from one point of view. Mm. And that's not what history is about. You will find when you have woke tech teachers that, for example, let's say you have, and I will call on you, an intersectional feminist college professor of some kind. And like odds are, if you go to college, you will. Here's the meaning of everything. Men suck. Men are evil. Men have been keeping women down. Men. Life's more complicated than that, kitten. It really is. Look at history. Have men had it so good? Most men are born into slavery, serfdom, or peasantry. Most men are born to work they're like dogs and then die young. After most men get relieved from being peasants, serfs, or slaves, they get to work as free men in factories 14, 15, 16 hours a day for six days a week. It is simply a falsehood to follow the simple, facile notion, men bad, oppressed women good, justice time. No, that is not history. That's propaganda. And there are all flavors of it. If I was teaching you America bleep yeah history, that would be also false. History is more complex and you need to get beyond that. And the only way to do that is to actually ask questions about meaning that are beyond any ideology. So, well said. Thank you. Uh, so I had. I think so. Controversy is like natural for us. It's in human nature. And without that controversy, life would be boring. And I think we wouldn't be as advanced as we are now. <laughs> Absolutely. Conflict brings out the best in us sometimes. It's uncomfortable and it can be dangerous and unpleasant. But uh, it was after 1900 that we developed our first aircraft. It was, I think, 67 years later that we went to the moon. In those 67 years, we had two world wars, a cold war, and a bunch of other strife and tension. But we learned a lot about how to build flying craft. And so there is that. And the same thing is true for social progress. Social progress happens when we notice what's wrong and when we try to do something about it. Yes? Okay, sir. Oh, ma'am, ma'am. Stop! Oh, I have twice as many people in here. Everyone's in different places. And, and you're hair. wearing a mask. And okay, eh, don't worry about the hair. Now, I know who you are. Okay, and um... Miss Owens, please go ahead. The, Thank you for forgiving me. <laughs> the, um... The history in itself isn't supposed to be comfy for everyone. That's just not how it works. If, whether you're Jewish, whether you, your family has come from slavery, whether you came from Germany or anything like that, it's not meant to be comfy because there's a lot of bad things that have happened throughout history that we have to learn about. Not to learn from it, but to know what happened and to know how that happened. Because if we're not going to learn from what happened, if we're not going to stop making the same mistakes. We're not going to stop doing what we're doing. But it helps us learn how to evolve from what happened and that if, if someone this happens again, we can learn what tactics were good, what things we can do to help us win and it can be really com uncomfortable like you're going to be talking about very harmful topics there's a lot of blood there's it's very gory there's a lot of stuff going on a lot of conflict mm -hmm. but ultimately if you're going to make the environment around you comfy you're not going to really understand what's going on because you're just going to see it from one point of view not see the full picture and just think that everything that happened was just good and cheery and that's not true yeah amen well said <laughs> folks you have a duty 
you're, you're, the, you're the antibodies of our society's body politic. As free people, it matters what you think. And part of your job is to see trends that happen. I thought of this question this weekend when I was reading for fun a book about a wizard in modern Chicago. It was an urban fantasy series called The Dresden Files. They're fun for me. In any event, I'm not selling it as high literature, but any author that speaks to you, any good author, will say things occasionally that resonate, that echo through you, like a tuning fork. Well, here's what echoed with me this weekend. In that book, Chicago was a 1945-style battleground between various magical factions. And many of the factions on the nasty side were killing every pet, every child, every woman, every man, every old person that they could find um, as acts of terror and, and blood sacrifice. And there's a moment where he's moving from battle to battle through an area that had been hit by these bad guys. And he doesn't have a contiguous memory of all of them. He has flashes. And at first he's grateful that only all he has is flashes because it limits the literally mind-shredding horror that he's observing. Imagine a crib with nothing in it but blood. It's horrible stuff. And at first he's grateful for the blissful forgetfulness between those horrible images that he'll hear, he'll keep for the rest of his life. These aren't things that get better with time. These are these are scars that are going to be with him forever. And then it occurs to him, no, he 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 has to remember. As painful and traumatic as it is, as much as it will change him, he has to remember. Why? Because these things happened, and because like so much human suffering, they didn't need to. If you know, learn nothing about history this year, learn this. Most of the stuff we do to one another is needless. The worst war in human history, World War II, was the most preventable war in human history. For a decade, people were trying to stop this from happening. But no! And it happened. But again and again and again and again and again, the people who made the war happen had opportunities to take another path, and they didn't. And what do we get? The worst war in human history, accompanied by the worst genocide thus far in human history. Modern history has a series of cycles. And one of the cycles is there's a traumatic event, the Black Death or the Thirty Years' War or the Napoleonic Wars or the World Wars or the Cold War, whatever. And the people who live through it afterwards pretty much stay on the straight and narrow. Why? Because they don't want that stuff to ever happen again. There are people for whom the words never again have special meaning. And most of them are relating to the final solution to the Jewish question, what people call the Holocaust. But it has happened again. There have been dozens, plural, of genocides, large and medium-sized and small, since World War II. The world goes on. There's one happening right now in northwestern China. And the world, at least there are people beginning to protest it, but the truth is, it's happening. But after the generation that remembers the trauma dies off, their children have their stories. Their grandchildren have some of their stories. Their great grandchildren, eh, yeah, yeah, it was a big thing that happened, big, big, big deal. And they forget. Like in a dark age, the knowledge is lost. The critical, visceral understanding at a gut level is lost. And we do the same basic, stupid things over and over. You know the utopian idea that we can evolve past certain things? You know, you watch Star Trek, oh, we've evolved past money, we've evolved past war. Baloney, we're human creatures. We don't evolve past this. We are what we are. We just have scarier, fancier toys. Part of your job is to understand the pain of events from the past. Part of my job is to convey that pain to you without, without gratuitousness, without going into red pornography, which is the pornography of blood and death, no. But to try to show you why it mattered. 
and to connect it to things that are happening today so that you will make meaning of history. Facts are not truth. We can all agree on most of the objective facts of history, but the truth of history? No, no, that's subjective. That's the meaning that you make from it. You are supposed to develop an understanding of the way history works and the way people are. Your understanding's not going to be mine. It's going to be yours. And whatever the details of your personal understanding of the meaning of history or the nature of human uh, life, you're then going to go around the world and you're going to be noticing trends. And you will notice healthy trends and unhealthy trends, and hopefully you will do something about it to aid the healthy trends and fight the unhealthy trends so that we don't once again go over the precipice into hell on earth, which could very well happen again with even worse toys than we used to have. Networked computers. Super germs. Not that that would ever happen. Atomics, hydrogen weapons, and so forth. So much of human suffering is preventable. It's self-inflicted and it's needless. And if more people understood what history really was, we'd have less of it. But that requires going through what we're going to go through this year. So if you find me obnoxious, well, that's a gift God gave me. I am. But I found a job where it actually is useful. And if you find this class annoying or needlessly controversial in your mind or whatever, too political, too religious, it's for a purpose. And that purpose is to give you a gut sense of where we've been, of what we're doing now, of what they have to do with one another, so that you can be wiser in your own lives and your own choices in defense of your own values. That's the hit of it. So, any questions, comments, or thoughts before we go into today's lesson? Yes? Well, I was going to say, it's more on topic with something that's happening. I think you know about the whole thing with, like, the coronavirus thing that's been spreading in the White House. Mm -hmm. How do you think that might affect, like, the future stuff with the elections? Well, get more? Uh, it's going to affect whether or how uh, the next uh, debates between Trump and Biden happen. It may or may not happen. Um, it's going to affect President Trump's ability to go out and campaign. He has been a very energetic campaigner. That's one of his strengths. Uh, the fact that even after being diagnosed with coronavirus, that he's still you know driving around waving at people, that's, that's a good sign from my point of view. Um, but this year has had so much stuff. I mean, look, 2018 stuff happened, but... Are people going to study 2018 in the history books? Probably not. Are they going to study 2020? Probably. Probably. Uh, and and we're still like two-thirds, three-quarters of the way through it. So we still have a quarter of the year to go. Um, I don't know. When I first heard he was sick, and now some of his key people are sick, I don't know. Uh, I, I hope that they are well, and I would have hoped that, that they were well if it was uh, Mr. Biden and his wife. Um, I, I don't want my enemies personally destroyed. I want their ideas discredited. That's a difference. Um, so hopefully uh, the American people will make their decision. Hopefully it will be a wise one, whatever that happens to be. But will it affect? Yes. I just don't know how. I, at this, I, no, Friday I, I, I heard the news. Yeah, whatever. I, I, I don't know. I wish I did. Okay, because I know that they think that they so are like know. spreading out more with the vice president debate that's coming up. Well, that depends. So far, Mr. Pence and his wife have have have, have um, not read as positive. And if that continues, I hope that it happens, because the American people have precious few opportunities to see these people under pressure. That's the point of a debate. It's like when I've hired people to work for me before I became a teacher, I would put them under some pressure in the interview to see how they handled the pressure. And the American people have a right to see how the person who has their finger on the nuclear button will react to pressure. That's So I hope that we will have that. Yes? Um, you mentioned the uh, genocide that's currently happening in northern China. Yeah. I do know that uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure that the, uh, that the people that they are currently being, that are currently being trapped there are Islamics. Yes. Yes, I do. Um, I also do know that the the fact that they are not only forcing um, 
the, the Islamic, Islamic people to pay, uh, pork, but they're also um, murdering the men in front of the women and children and forcing the women to wear prerogative clothing as well as ripping off their hijabs and whatnot. Well, they're also putting them in re-education camps and they're brainwashing over a million people right yeah, now but, as we speak. But, over a million people. But Islamics have always been like a controversial subject. I don't know why. It's, it might it might have been because of the 9-11 bombing or whatever. It wasn't a bomb. But no, it, it, it has less to do with the Uyghurs being Muslims and more than being not Han Chinese. Han Chinese is the dominant ethnic group within China and it's the dominant historical and cultural um, <clears throat> The Tibetans in southwestern China and the Uyghurs in northwestern China are different. They're, Tibetans are Buddhists, the Uyghurs are Muslim, but they're both being treated to this horror show. What's happening in Tibet echoes what happened in Xinjiang a few years ago. They're, they're starting in Tibet what they had done in, 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 in that. Islam is an, is an unusually militant religion. Of all the wars happening, about 80 to 90 percent of them involve Muslims in some way, shape, or form. And this has to do with the example of the Prophet Muhammad. He was a war leader. He led jihad. But uh, what's happening under the Chinese is not about protecting themselves against Muslims. It's about making China a monoculture. And that means destroying minority groups, um, turning them into Han Chinese, uh, either by interbreeding or by cultural uh, assimilation or by absolute physical destru destruction. And it's, it's happening. And again, you know, it's easy to say never again. But remember, what it took to stop the Holocaust was troops on the ground. And how many people are willing to go to war right now in China over the Uyghurs? Maybe me, but that's a minority. Yes. Sure. Oh, you never have to ask. Just sign out the pass. If the pass is there, you can go. Okay, I, I gotta, I gotta move on. I give you five seconds. So. I was gonna say, aren't the the re-education camps kind of like the concentration camps? But yeah. Yes, but more effective because we now have modern computer technology to make things easier. Yeah, that's it's scary stuff. Anyway, ah, uh, thank you for the conversation. So, we talked about uh, how the Renaissance is a product of pros plague prosperity. We talked about how it is the introduction of ancient knowledge into a new Christian context. We talked about the focus on art and the rise of the individual as an ideal. Wow, I'm in ancient. Sorry. Okay. Where where we've been and where we are. I'm tired. Uh, and it's fun. We all are. Yeah. Okay, so we've gone through Zoroastrianism, which is Persian dualism, Lord of Light, Lord of Dark, both equal, human choice determines. Genesis 1, the seven-day creation story. Genesis 2, uh, men and women and what their roles are and what they're for. Now uh, we are into the Islamic myths and from the Quran, and let me see if I can find if anyone did those. <laughs> So, we are in 4, and 4B, uh, Islamic creation myths, there's nobody in 4B that has that, and we go to 4A, and nobody has that. Um, what? When we were in Sunday's uh, uh, miss, I was actually out of school, and I never got a chance to get to Okay. Uh, would, it, would it give me a bunch of copies on it? Well, you could do that. Um, yeah, okay. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I'd rather have you take one near the end. Uh, so, which ones are not chosen in here? Uh, if Darwin isn't chosen. Goldiaski is doing some great things. We have a lot of people doing great things. Tell you what, uh, you can just do a video for me because I'm going to cover them in class today. Okay, so but you, you can add to what I do because what I do is going to be quick. So, Islamic myths. We've got uh, two of them, and they're very short from the Quran. I'm just going to read them and go over what they are. We, this is the Lord God Almighty, Allah the Merciful, the Compassionate, we created man of an extraction of clay. Then we set him a drop in a receptacle secure. Then we created of the drop a clot. Then we created of the clot a tissue. 
Then we created of the tissue bones. Then we garmented the bones in flesh. Thereafter, we produced him as another creature. So blessed be God, the fairest of creators. So what that is, is a recipe for how to make man. You start out uh, with uh, basically an essence, and then you build on that essence until you have a full human being. Uh, so in that sense, that's the physical uh, description of how God does it. Now, section 5 from the Quran, chapter 55, verses 5 through 30. The All-Merciful has taught the Quran. He created man, and he taught him the explanation. That's Islam. The sun and the moon to a reckoning, and the stars and the trees bow themselves. In heaven, he raised it up and set the balance. Transgress not in the balance. Weigh with justice and skimp not the balance. And the earth, he set it down for all beings. In effect, what this is, is God is the creator of all things. Remember in Seventh-day uh, seventh Creation Story in Genesis 1, they list the various things that God has made, and it is said explicitly, everything is made by God. In effect, that's what the second little bit from the Quran is. Now, who, if anyone, did the Babylonian creation? We have Julia. Is there anyone from 4B? And uh, when I set this up, I set it up as if we were going to keep our A, B difference of difference. So some of you may have the same one of these. So B, Babylonian, nobody. So Julia, it's you. Uh, I have to go for soccer and persevere. Can you stay for like a minute or two and then go? Because it's... The game's in Yorkstown. <laughs> Ergle, get gone. Good luck. Crush them. That's destroy them. Uh, no. No, no, no. When you, uh, Julia, either um, do a video for me. Okay? Good luck. Okay, so we're looking now at the Babylonian creation. This is myth six. I'm going to read some of it, and I'll give you an idea. In the beginning, there was Apsu, the sky god, and Tiamat, the chaos goddess. From their union came all gods. These younger gods grew restless and chose Marduk as their champion. It is he who finished the work of creation by slaying Tiamat, his mother, and Kingu, her lover. Okay, so now that's a flash forward. Now we flash back. Then joined issue Tiamat and Mardu, wisest of gods. Imagine Tiamat as a giant dragon, and Marduk as a heroic human like figure. Then joined issue Tiamat and Marduk, wisest of gods. They strove in single combat, locked in battle. The Lord spread out his neck to enfold her. The evil wind which followed behind, he let loose in her face. When Tiamat opened her mouth to consume him, he drove the evil wind that she closed not her lips. At the fierce winds charged her belly. Her body was distended. Her mouth was wide open. He released the arrow. It tore her belly. It cut through her inside, splitting her heart. Having thus subdued her, he extinguished her light. He cast down her carcass to stand upon it. After he had slain Tiamat, the leader, her band was shattered, her troop broken up, and the gods, her helpers who marched off uh, at her side, trembling with terror, turned their backs about in order to save their lives, tightly encircled. They could not escape. Marduk made them captives, and he smashed their weapons, thrown into the net. They found themselves ensnared, placed in cells. They were filled with wailing, bearing his wrath. They were held imprisoned. At the door. The Lord trod on the lets of Tiamat. So the Lord is Mardu trotting. Now, I picture this as a comic book battle. I honestly do. So there you've got Marduk and Tiamat fighting on the earth and in the heavens, battling one another like Superman and one of Super. No, Superman's boring. Like Batman and one of his villains, or Captain America and Captain Axis, whatever. Marduk strikes her, 
she avoids. This is creepy. The wind, the evil wind, he let loose the evil wind that follows. Guys, all I can picture is the gas that comes out of a human being's nether regions. In any event, he emits gas that fills her to the point where she's like a balloon. Then he shoots an arrow and pops her. Then uh, he kills her. And her body is on the ground and her aides and assistants are defeated. He then uses her body to make creation. Now, we're going to the middle of the right-hand column, etc. Marks. He constructed, he being Marduk, stations for the great gods, fixing their astral likenesses as constellations. He determined the year by designing the zones. He set up three constellations for each of the twelve months. When Marduk hears the words of the gods, his heart prompts him to do artful works. Opening his mouth, he addressed Ea, god of waters. Blood I will mass and cause bones to be. I will establish a savage man shall be his name. Truly savage man I will create. He shall be charged with the service of the gods that they might be at ease. It was Kingu who contrived the uprising and made Tiamat rebel and join battle. They bound Kingu, holding him <clears throat> before Ea. They imposed on him his guild and severed his blood vessels. Out of his blood they fashioned mankind. Ea imposed the service and let free the gods. After Ea, the wise had created mankind, had imposed on it the service of the gods. So what is the purpose of human life? in the Babylonian myth. Yes. To serve their gods. To serve the gods. We basically do the work while they relax. We are their servitors. We are there to service them. The nature of the divine world is a conflict. Conflict between Marduk, the hero god, and the various other gods of wild nature. <clears throat> You'll also learn later in the Babylonian myths that human beings are so damn loud that we cause consternation to the gods. But that is another story for another time. Next, the Hindu myths. Let's see who's doing the Hindu myth cycle in here. Foray. Well, it looks like Hannah Foster. Where are you? Oh, Hannah Foster. Um, oh, that's you? Uh, I'm, I'm, you're doing it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and let me just check and see if anyone else. I've got these things all over the place. Yep, all right, you are. So, all right, you go ahead, Hannah. Get me a video by Friday. Normally, I'm not so relaxed about these things. Remember, please start by identifying yourself and your myth, and then you've got about three minutes. Okay. Um, my name is Hari, and I'm doing the creation myth. And basically, the ancient Hindus were best known for their uh, huge contributions to our modern world, including the discovery of decimals, algebra, and square roots. But they also, um, while they were like a land of like scholars and knowledge, they were also a land of sages and spirituality. And they have really intricate myths where like it involves like a lot of like things with reincarnation and life and animals and stuff. And it starts out kind of like the Genesis myth, where they like start off with dark formless fog and then Brahma, which is their rod, basically um, sweeps away the darkness and then creates seeds and places them into an egg. And the egg, he eventually cracks open the egg, and in that egg is our solar system. And there's basically just tons and tons of eggs all around, like, the, um, like, the worlds, and those are several different universes. And then, basically, he creates, like, the first male, which is Perusa, and from him he creates, like, man. And the funny thing about, like, the Hindu myths is that um, Brahma, even though he created the world, he is not the main god. The main gods are Shiva. And Vishnu, and Vishnu is the preserver of the universe, and Shiva is the pe person who destroys it in order to recreate it. And basically, humans come into this when 
they're not actually really important in the creation story. They're kind of just there. Like, he created them, and then that's it. It's mostly, most of the creation myth story is based on Brahma and how he creates it. He creates the eight points of the horizon, the eternal above waters, and then he creates, like, self-conscious as well as ego and sight, um, hearing, tasting, smelling, and touching, and then, yeah, that's basically it. There's not a lot of, like, details with it. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, Ari. Get your grade on your way back to your seat. Watch where you wait while you were Okay. Now we, uh, about the Hindu myths. Uh, here's what I would have you know. These three myths are from different times in the Hindu tradition, basically separated out by hundreds of years. In one myth, the universe is created, there's an egg, Brahma hatches out of the egg and he does the creating. In another, there is no first cause, it simply begins. There is no god of creation, there are the three gods that appear as part of creation. And then in the third myth, it basically says, we're not sure if there was a first cause or not. We're not sure if there was a creator god or not. But what we know is these three gods appeared, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, and after that, the other gods, the lesser gods, and so forth. So with the Hindu myths, what stands out for me is the question of, is there a creator, a person who creates, or is creation simply a natural process? Anyway, that's what stands out for me. Now, Chinese, uh, Titan, Chris Reynolds. Yeah, okay, you set? Can I take this off? Um, so I'm Titan, and I did the Chinese creation myth. Um, so ancient China was well known for its like four great inventions. Um, that was like gunpowder, paper, printing, and the compass. So they just um, they invented a lot of things like that, and they learned how to make um, silk. So they were really well known for like silk making, and um, they managed to keep like that secret, uh, a secret for like. Um, hundreds of years, so that made them like really important and everything because they were like the only ones who knew how to do it. Um, and then, so China is located um, just in the Middle Eastern part of Asia and shares its borders with Mongolia, Kazakhstan, Nepal, so like that. Um, there isn't necessarily like a overall climate. Um, and then getting to like the actual myth, um, so there's just a lot of there's a lot of different Chinese creation myths that like really all contradict each other. Um, some myths don't mention gods, and others say that there were many deities um, created in the 15 days of Chinese New Year. So just a lot of different myths just all colliding, um, not really making a whole lot of sense. Um, there are some common themes in a lot of these myth uh, myths and where like death is like a big, big problem there. And um, that's like the closest um, to evil that's really been reported because Chinese myths are often um, very peaceful. Um, there's yin and yang um, in most of them, um, but they don't represent good and evil, they represent peace and harmony. So they just work together, like there's not, um, there's not good and evil, like there isn't like the Zoroastrian myths and stuff like that. Um, and then Confucianism is a big part of it. Um, it says that death is something not to be feared, however there is no afterlife. So like death, it's not, um, it's not great, but it should not be like feared, it's not the worst thing. Um, and then Taoism is also rooted in. Like, I wouldn't talk too much about that. We have somebody else doing Taoism. Oh, perfect. I don't have really anything on it, so I'll skip that. Um, so 
a very like distinct and common part of all the myths and beliefs is like just that focus on peace and harmony and evil spirits don't really have a place in these myths um, and all deities have like good intentions um, and then I think I think China in general gets um, like a bad reputation due to its like communist government and um, genocide currently and whatnot um, but if you really focus on the culture and beliefs um, rooted in um, China itself, you'll notice how much of it is focused on like living calm and peaceful lives and doing what's right. So I feel like that really contradicts. Um, and um, and like I was saying, yin and yang, um, there's just a lot of peace um, that's rooted in their culture. And I just found that really interesting and redeeming to China itself. Um, especially now, with all considered. Okay. Okay. While um, let's see, who's uh, Eva, Eva, does. yeah. So while you get ready to go up there, <clears throat> a few things about China. Come on up. First off, Titan's right. There's a lot in China's past to be uh, in wonder about. One of the things I hate about Chinese communism the worst is that from 1948, when they took power, through the mid-1970s, there were a series of campaigns to destroy all of them. To destroy the buildings, to destroy the language, to destroy the culture. China's Communist Party waged a war against China's traditions because they wanted to start fresh. And now that same government claims to be the heir of the very Chinese culture that it spent 40 years trying to destroy, 30 years. Uh, it's it's, it's it, it, maddening. It is. It's like somebody <clears throat> who beats on a puppy and then gets sad because the puppy doesn't love them. It's their own fault. Um, the Chinese myth that Titan did is not one that involves gods. So this is something that you should know. In this Chinese myth cycle, uh, you start out with everything being a universal soup, sort of this gunk that's going to make everything. And then there's an open spot, an empty spot. It's like the opposite of the creation story from Genesis, where there's nothing, and then God says, let there be light, and there's light, and it was good. In this case, there's this mixture of stuff, of everything, earth, air, fire, water, uh, spirit, and then there's an open spot. And now we have an area of emptiness and an empty of fullness, and it compresses and it separates the universe out into hot, cold, yin, yang, light, and dark, and all that. There is not the moral component. That is absolutely right. So no gods, no good and evil morality. Uh, but there is a natural process of elemental powers that are interacting with one another that ultimately produce the differentiation that brings our world into being. So it's a natural, almost like physics. Um, yes, you have something else? Okay, so thank you for waiting. And you're up. Okay, so I did Taoism. Who are you? Oh, yes. My name is Ava Duffy, and I did Taoism. And so pretty much what it says in the packet is that there was no definition of existence. It just, were it in the packet, it says that words came from the womb of matter. And so really there's no specific, like, the, the universe, it just was. And so there were no words in the beginning, like I said. And so what I found interesting was that it focuses more on the words more than like how it was created because there was no definition of existence. And I also found out that words created differences. And so without words, everything would be the same. So that was interesting. And so what the passage says about the universe is that the universe does not have words. 
until matter was formed. And so matter was pretty much the reason why we have words and why we have diversity and differences. And so, and it says that humans use words for everything and that we really rely on words on in different perspectives. So without words, like I keep saying, it would it would all be the same. The world would just be the same. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay. Taoism to me is one of the more fun ones. In effect, what it says is that we delude ourselves into thinking that we understand things that we really don't. And that delusion takes the form of language, which gives us the uh, impression that we understand things, that we understand their meaning. We really don't. I'm actually going to read it. Ah, uh, let's. Because Eva did a good job with something that's very counterintuitive to us Westerners. This, by the way, is the last one we're doing today. Existence is beyond the power of words to define. Terms may be used, <clears throat> but are none of them absolute. In the beginning of heaven and earth, there were no words. Words came out of the womb of matter. And whether a man dispassionately sees to the core of life or passionately sees its surface, the core and the surface are essentially the same. Only words make them seem different, only to express appearance. If name be needed, wonder names them both from wonder into wonder existence opens. So, God or the gods or the universe made itself. The elemental powers creates. The reality is much more important than the label. Our pretense of understanding and control that language gives us is an illusion. And if we disabuse ourselves of it, we can get to the truth. Whether a person, a person focuses and sees to the core of life, I picture a scientist in a laboratory studying uh, an electron microscope, or whether they passionately see the surface like a surfer riding a wave. It's basically the same experience. A scientist in the moment of their intellectual discovery, a surfer in the moment of riding a wave, they are both experiencing wonder. And that's the reaction we should have to the universe. Not a sense of assurance, not a sense of, oh, it's just matter. A sense of wonder. If you keep that sense of wonder alive, then you are alive. Taoism is not intellectual. Taoism is mystical. In, uh, in China, Taoism is sort of the spiritual side of their big troika of Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism. Taoism is this sense that life is not about what's up here. It's not about what comes out of this. Life is, and a wise person experiences life without letting this or this get too much in the way. Anyway, that's for what it is, uh, what I think. So, uh, we will continue tomorrow. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand out stuff... Um, so we'll stick around until I give you what you have. Once I'm done, D-Day people can go, A-Day people can get their lunch and come back. Uh, I'm going to call names. Hermsmeyer. Okay. Tell me. Davis. Sorry. Okay. Daigle. What? Okay. Thanks. Duncan is not here. Duffield. Dolbiowski. Here. Smith. Beagleman. Anna Foster. A's. Anna Foster, out here. Anna Foster, okay. Uh, Titan, Titan, Titan. Emma. Alice is here. Je Hermsmeyer, that's you. Natal. 
Bagel's not here. Duffield is here. Well, you see, it's here. Oh, yeah. It's here. Fieldman. Helms. So, Dampus. Anderson. Dampus. Stanley. Claudia. Where's Claudia? Ava Duffy. Hey. Oh, no, no, no. Rylan Dixon. Julie is not here. Izzy. Isabella is Michelson. Not here. You are here, I'm not seeing you. Mira Crawford. She's what? Okay. Janae. Flores. Baldwin? My fault, sorry. Ella? Ryland. Campbell. Campbell. Janae. Zoe. Sorry, can you that down? Baldwin. Crawford is not here. Soccer. Stanley. Bagel. Sheffield. Beagleman. Anderson, Davis, Reynolds, please wait, I'm almost done. Will it be a speed? You're not, if I'm not done in 30 seconds, you can leave. Beagle, Hermsmeyer. Okay, I guess you're done. Have a good day. If you're in B day, if you're A day, I'll be doing attendance again in five minutes. So get your lunch and come back. Thank you. Come again.